Hey, what's going on? You're a part of the A-game live from a shared universe studios on the Jersey Shore. I'm Rob Akampora. Hopefully, if you are in Jersey watching this, you are safe wherever you are because the uh, snow that is coming down now is starting to hit right where we are. As a matter of fact, it's not even raining. Now it's become pure snow. And I know uh, this gentleman to my right, um, where his hometown is, I think is about to get clobbered a little bit up in Boonton. I think they're talking like a foot, a foot and a half, Peter. Yeah, that's my brother just said. I just got off the phone with him. You know, he has a house in Cape May, too. He said he didn't think it was going to get hit, but I think Cape May is going to get it a little bit, too. Uh, well, welcome to the first official snow of the year, and you're safe in Los Angeles. <laughs> I miss it, man. I love it. I love the winter. Okay. Peter Honorati, very happy to have you here. Thanks for coming on board. And, uh, yeah, that's the one thing I do realize. You don't get to change the seasons. I mean, how often do you get back to the Booten area? Well, before COVID, man, I, I was back to uh, uh, to home at least twice a year. Uh, I brought my boys back with me. They they uh, got four days at the Jersey Shore every summer. They went rafting down to Delaware. They went into New York City. So they, you know, they know Jersey pretty well. And then over the last seven years, um, until my father passed away, he was fighting back from a stroke. So I was I was back in Jersey three four times a year. Oh wow! Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah you you definitely I can tell you're very proud of your Jersey roots without question. Absolutely. The only time I don't like being here is when I was always there in November. It's when <laughs> there's nothing going on, man. No leaves. Everything is black and gray and brown. Yeah. And I'd rather have December or January. I love the snow. And yeah. here's the greatest thing about about being back, about growing up back east or even living there for a while. Right. No matter what type personality you are however they categorize them now a b x y whatever mm -hmm. you have to slow down for three months a year because everybody else is <laughs> and that's a good thing yeah absolutely i would agree with that hey listen the one thing i do realize that you may not realize our ties that bind us are a lot more than just one or two things um I just discovered this actually today when I was doing my homework. The first film you ever did um, was this little film called Firehouse. I mean, the lead actress in the film is a lady named Gianna Palm uh, Chas Palminteri's wife. But when I knew Gianna, she was Gianna Ronaldo, who went to yeah. high school with me at St. John Vianney. I was talking to her brother, Virgil, earlier today. I said, Virgil, you may want to tip off your sister that I'm interviewing Peter. And he's like, no way. So, I mean, it's kind of interesting that I had no idea you had done a film with her. I know I guess she married Chaz Palminteri. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell do I know? You know what, though? Here's a really good piece of, of, of uh, minutia about that movie. Okay. okay. So I was still in the business world at the time. I was still, you know, my MBA, my Park Avenue job. But right. I took off to do the movie. And uh, the character I played was a real sleazebag. And... Uh, so they had me walking into the firehouse with two girls on my arm and one was taller than me, really pretty, you know, and I said to her, I said, you know, I'm in ads, ad, uh, you know, advertising and ad sales and, and publishing. You'd be really, really good, you know, in that business, you know, you're smart and blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, Julia Roberts. It was the first time she ever appeared on camera. Oh my God. And the only reason I know this is because I was doing a movie in Canada one time. Some guy was writing an unauthorized biography on her. And he called me and said, Did you know that the first time Julia Roberts ever appeared on camera was on your arm in Firehouse? I go, I said, You know, there was this woman. She was taller. And I told her she'd be great at selling ad space. <laughs> And it was Julia Roberts. <laughs> oh, my God. That's a great story. <laughs> yeah. Yep. You said you were not really doing full-time acting. I mean, was the turning point right around 1990? Because at that point, it was like things start to click. I mean, right before that, you had an uh, arc on Kate Nally on CBS. Right. And then you had, like, Kate, Nally was, Kate Nally was my first TV job. I had been in the business for about a year or two. Mm -hmm. uh, I left the business world uh, in like 86. Okay. And, uh, and I immediately enrolled in a class taught by a guy by the name of Bob Collier, who was like a recovering alcoholic. He was a second banana, like, uh, like an Ed McMahon type. Mm -hmm. This great class in, in, uh, com in how to, how to book a commercial. 
Um, and within uh, two weeks, I was on hold for a national beer commercial. But this is 1986. So here's the stereotypes they were looking for in casting. Okay. Bruce Springsteen, Billy Joel, Tony Danza, and Bruce Willis. Piece of each. Yeah, that's true. I definitely see the Tony Danza, Bruce Springsteen in you for sure. And Tony and I know each other now, and there's been a couple of times we've done personal appearances together. And I said, hey, man, thanks you know, for the start to my career. <laughs> The National Beer commercial you mentioned, um, I think, uh, Ming, can you give me photo 11? I think this is the uh, uh, part of that commercial with Conrad Dobler for Miller Lite. There yeah. you are, left. Yep. Yeah. Tastes great. Less feeling. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and, and I'm very happy that you actually post that one on your uh, Facebook page recently because I, had rem when you put it up there, I looked and went, oh, my God, I do remember that commercial because that was sort of a fun take on Conrad Dolber's character as a football player. Like, I'm um, this yeah, main, exactly. you know, antagonistic guy. And, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a really nice guy. And then, of course, you get into the argument with the guy on his other yeah. side. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So that was a huge break, and then I, I, I like I was saying, 1990. It's like you you wind up in three films, and all three. Uh, well, Postcards from the Edge is a great film. And then you do Firebird, which you had a small role in. But if I can get the photo number 15 there, Ming, um, this one, Goodfellas. I mean, 30 years later. I mean, yeah. that film, no matter where you go, it's on TV somewhere on the globe at yeah. least once or twice a day. I mean, when you look back 30 years now, did you ever think that, wow, this has become an iconic piece of film? Well, listen, I knew it would be a big deal. It was, I was, there's a great story about how I ended up getting it. Mm -hmm. um, so we had already moved to L.A., right? And, but I was still doing Kate and Alley in New York. Okay. So my wife was here pregnant with my first son and I did the last episode of Kate and Allie on a Thursday night in front of an audience. And Friday I had a two 30 flight out of JFK to come back for my son was due that next Monday. Oh, whoa. <laughs> so I get so on a two 30 flight. I get a call back for Scorsese in Rockefeller center at 1230. Right. Oh, right. So now I got to take it. And cool. So at that time, for the roles, like mine, the smaller roles, uh, Scorsese was giving everybody the same sides, the same scenes to read. Mm -hmm. and if you like you, they just pick out, uh, you know, a, a spot for you. But he also was seeing for small roles like I had real mob guys or cops that chased those real mob guys. Oh, so we all, we all had the same scenes. Mm -hmm. So I walk in. To the outer office of the casting office, and there's these guys sitting there with silver sweatsuits and patent leather sneakers, right? Smoking a cigar. The guy looks at me and he goes, What are you reading for? <laughs> and I go, Well, I got the signs for Sunny Bamboo. He goes, You know him? I go, No, I don't know him. He goes, I know him. You don't look nothing like him. Oh, and I said, Well, that's what they gave me. He goes, all right, kid, God bless you. <laughs> you know? And then since I was still kind of new to the business, right. I had a habit of trying to make the meeting mine, even with Scorsese, because it was just, you know, coming from ad sales and publishing and, and ad executives that I worked with, you'd always try and make the meeting yours. So I, I walked into the office. Now, my grandfather's last name is Scorsese, exactly the same without the S. Right. So I made up a story before I did the, the callback. I said, listen, before we get started, I need to know if if we're you know related, because I said to my grandfather, Donato Scorsese, I said, I'm reading for the great director Martin Scorsese today. And and you know, I you know, and my grandfather said, I think so I have a cousin one time which taken the S out of the name. Right? So Scorsese goes, really? Really? Because we can't find our relatives. I'm going, oh, shit. Now I'm, screwed. now I'm really screwed. I made the whole thing up, right? And I said, okay, well, well, where are you from? He goes, Sicily. I go, no fucking way. We're not from Sicily. He goes, where are you from? I said, well, we're from, we're Napolitans. He goes, hey, you guys drink too early in the morning. You want to do this? I go, yeah, let's do it. So we did the scene. 
I flew home and, and I got the role. And then I flew back after my son was born in March. I flew back in May and, uh, and did the movie. Wow. And that scene is such a, a pivotal scene because it kind of changes the tone of the movie as they come down to Florida and basically, um, well, we can be honest about it, kick the uh, living crap out of you. Did I lose you? You there? Are you there, Peter? Yeah, I think I lost you for a minute. No, no, no problem. I was about to say the, the, uh, the scene in the movie, Goodfellas, was sort of like a bridge scene, as I would like to call it, because, you know, Henry Hill's being sent down to Florida. There you are getting your ass basically kicked, and then it was that whole scene where the sister turns you in and everybody's going to jail. So it kind of really yeah. sort of that the turn of the movie at that point was your scene. Yeah, it was an important scene, and, and, and you know, it's really funny. I have uh, – I went. I went to get some pictures, uh, uh, some copies of pictures for you know for autographs and stuff. Right. And I went with a friend of mine, and the place where I was getting the copies made, the guy looked at me and he says, "Are you?" You know. I said, "Yeah." And he said, "And and then my friend Jerry said, uh, hey, you know, he was in Goodfellas.'" And he, and the guy says to me, "Really?" Yeah. I I said, "Yeah, I was." You know, the, the Florida book. He goes, he goes, "Hey," he said, "Henry Hill before he died, painted." a whole bunch of scenes from Goodfellas. He says, and I think he picked that scene, right? Whoa. So I, I go back to get the pictures and he went online and he found the painting that Henry did of that scene. Oh. took a photo of it and gave me a photo of it, right? It's nice. So now I'm thinking, I'm thinking, this is crazy. So I went online and I bought the original painting, right? <laughs> right. So I have Henry Hill's painting of me, you know, hanging over, you know, and the lion's looking up. And it, I'm, I'm going to tell you, the technique looks like a third grader, but it's so great <laughs> to have. You, know? you had to. You had to. Absolutely. Oh, it's fantastic. So, you know, so it came around full circle. <laughs> great stories with Peter Onorati here on the A-Game. Um, after Goodfellas came an interesting experiment. And I think the, if I can put up a photo number 12, when, with Cop Rock, it's, it's a love-hate thing with people. I mean, there you are in your a singing scene uh, from all the episodes. But what's interesting, on one side of the equation, you know, sadly, TV Guy called it one of the worst shows ever created. But then, and it's a really fascinating article. If you can find it, go get it. It was an article that came out in 2016 from Time Magazine. They titled it, How a Legendary Failure Predicted TV's Future. Yeah. And when you think about it, Boschko and those guys were so far ahead of the curve because now we're yeah. seeing a lot of movies that are turning into musicals. You got a show on um, NBC, Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist, which basically is yes, sort of yes. the premise, even though the plot's not about cops, the premise right. is similar to what you guys were doing on Cop Rock. I actually auditioned for that show to play the father. Oh, you're, oh wow. Talk about yeah, good yeah. cyclical. That would, oh, that would have been yeah. interesting. That would have been great, you know. Um, but yeah, no, listen, in 2016 or 17, uh, my manager called me. She says, I got this. Somebody sent, uh, you know, a tear sheet from a newspaper in the Midwest, and it was a picture of, um, oh, what's her name? She did her first job on my sitcom, a big star. She was in Glee. Uh, 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 J uh, Jane. Oh, no. Jane Lynch. Jane Lynch? And, yes, very funny so lady. There's a, big, there's a picture of Jane Lynch, and then down below there's a picture of me and Larry Joshua. Mm -hmm. And the title of the article said, Before There Was Glee, there was Cop Rock. Wow. That's yeah. accurate. It really is accurate. And I'll tell you something. Cop Rock did really well in the cities. It was, mm -hmm. you know, outside there that no nobody got it, you know. And, and, and the, the pilot episode, the music was written by Randy Newman. Right. You know? And, and, and I, I, it just, there's the last scene in the pilot where Kathleen Wilhoyd sings a Randy Newman lullaby to her baby and then sells it for two hundred dollars drug money into adoption, mm -hmm. to me is really still one of the best moments I've ever seen in television. You know, yeah, I can tell you that's there's a lot of passion with that uh, that whole one season, all eleven episodes, and um, that was a risk. I mean, I think for everybody involved, but at the same token, it, you you seem like somebody who's like, hey, look, good work is good work. Just do it. Not one person in that show regrets doing it. Not one. And, and if you look, if you look at some, there's a couple episodes where 
Cheryl Crow was a background. Yes, I, I did find that recently on YouTube. It was the I think it was the final episode that you were doing, and there's Cheryl Crow, who's an, not even released Tuesday Night Music Club yet. So this is right. pre uh, Cheryl right. Crow being Cheryl Crow. Right, and then you had C- Carl Anderson, who was Judas in the movie Jesus Christ Superstar, brilliant performer, and Carl's Carl's gone now. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, um, who else? There was. Uh, it was uh, uh, Luther Price, I think, was his name. Was torn with the Temptations. Uh, we had we had two Academy Award winners on this on the on the writing stack. My friend Donnie Markowitz wrote "Time of Your Life" for Dirty Dancing. Oh, I and, didn't realize that. Wow. And then Amanda McBroom was on the writing staff, and she wrote uh, "The Rose." Oh, wow, that's and it's it's, an, it's incredible the talent that was there, and you don't even realize it, or at least some of us don't realize it. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah, it was a great thing to do. I always wanted to get an Emmy so I could just stand up there and say, thank you very much, Cop Rock. It's the best thing I ever did. <laughs> hey, still time. Still time. It could still happen. Peter, that also, did that really enforce your relationship with Stephen Boschko? Because you wound up appearing on a few more shows that Boschko had created or wrote, and especially because I'm looking at the uh, photo right above you. Uh, I believe yeah. that is the Civil Wars photo there with uh, Mariel yeah. anyway, yes. Mariel, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so what, when, when Cop Rock was canceled, Boschko called me into his office and said, because, uh, you know, my character on Cop Rock was not supposed to be a regular I was supposed to sing a love song to my gun after four episodes and blow my brains out, you know? <laughs> right. And, you know, I had just gotten to California and I wanted to be in movies anyway. And I went, wow, this is a great way to go out of television, right? <laughs> right. But, but the network liked the character so much that they ended up making me a regular. So in the initial, you know, conception of the show, LaRusso was not a regular, was not going to be in there for all four. So at the end, when they finally made me a regular, um, Stephen called me and said, uh, hey, has ABC called you? And I said, no. He goes, well, they're going to call you and uh, offer you a holding deal. And I said, great. What's that? You know? <laughs> you still knew with this, huh? of course. I see. I, you know, he says, well, they're going to pay so much to hold you to do an ABC show, right? Right. So, um, so then I hear about Civil Wars um, uh, with Mario. Well, Mario wasn't in the mix at the time. Okay. And, uh, um, and uh, Stephen wanted me to play a role that actually Joey Pants did in the uh, in the pilot. It was a it was a recurring um, a private detective, you know. Mm-hmm. And and then I got I got a call from Stephen Cannell about doing the commish. I got a call from a couple other you know people to for leads, you know. Right. So I I went back to Stephen and I said, you know, I I, I want to work with you, but these other People are calling me about leads and shows and, you know, you're offering me this recurring thing. Mm-hmm. So they, they read me uh, for Charlie Howe and I got the part. And then they, they didn't have a female lead. Uh, um, so, you know, they did a search and, and, and they came up with uh, Marielle, you know. And then in the second season, Stephen, I just said this, to, I, I, I just worked on This Is Us and Ken Olin was uh, the director of this episode. He's also an exec producer on it. Right. And I just told this story to him. So I'm, I'm on the second season of, uh, of, of uh, um, Civil Wars. And um, Stephen sends the NYPD pilot down to my trailer. He says, give this a read. And let me know what you think. Oh, wow. And so I read it. And I went, Jesus, I mean, this is like, you know, fantastic. I said, but you just knew the minute you started reading it. I said, what's with the Irish surname of the lead character? Are we not working in, together anymore? What's with the Kelly thing, you know? Right. And he goes, F you, you got your own show because Civil Wars hadn't been canceled yet, you know? Oh, okay, gotcha. So I said, well, let me do Sipowitz. Let me do Sipowitz because you guys, you guys you c- could kill me off. You do that better than anybody, right? There you he go. Goes, no, 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 no. Just shut up and read the pilot and get back to me. So uh, I didn't realize that they actually really created Sipowitz for Dennis, you know? Dennis Franz, uh, yeah. Yeah, and Dennis is just a phenomenal person and just yeah. a, a better actor than he is a person, you know? <laughs> um, and so so, so nothing happened with it. Uh, and then a, a few years later, um, this, is, this is what I was telling Ken as well. See, I'm on my machine. I have that. I have an impersonation of my grandfather like I just did before. It's just, 
a la live with the message, and blah, 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 you know, right? Right. So on my machine is David Milch, and he goes, hello, Peter. This is your friend, David Milch. I want you should come play with us on NYPD Blue. And so I call my agents and my manager. I go, this is David Milch on my home phone. You guys better get me another series right now, right? Right. So I, I, so I did this great arc as 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 an old um, neighborhood buddy of Jimmy Smith's. Mm -hmm. It was at the time when Jimmy was off the force for whatever reason. I know I never watched NYPD because it broke my heart. So, you know, right. it, I understand that. Yeah. At one point, Jimmy was off the force for a while and he hooks up with this old mobster uh, buddy of his from the neighborhood who offers him a job, you know. And at the time I had I had a pilot. And I said to David, I said, well, what's what do you want for this role? What's going on? He goes, well, he said, you remember Ray Sharkey in Wise Guy? And I said, yeah. He yeah. said, I kind of want this character like that, that Ray Sharkey character. I said, great. I said, uh, and he said, you know, we just do the last four episodes of the season and then we'll go on until next year. And I said, okay, but I got a pilot. He goes, man, no problem. You get the pilot, we'll, we'll kill you, you know, whatever. <laughs> so, so I, I, you know, I jumped on board. And then the last day of shooting, I get a call from my manager and she says, did you get a fax? And I go, no. Boop, the fax machine goes on, right? Right. And I get these pages, and they call me up and they say, We need you in at six o'clock tonight, and they're killing me off, right? Right. After three episodes, four episodes, whatever it was. So I'm like, Okay, I don't care. I got a pilot, and next Monday I'll find out if it goes or not, you know? Sure. Well, at three o'clock in the morning on the New York City street that's in on the Fox lot, Dennis drove down from um, from Santa Barbara and Jimmy were sitting there on the curb with David Milch going, what's the matter with you? Don't get rid of this character. Don't kill this character off. But, you know, Milch, the genius that he is, he won out, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that night I died. And that Monday I died again because they didn't pick up my pilot. Oh, uh, <laughs> that hurts. And, and again, going back to what you were saying before, hard to watch NYPD Blue knowing when you read it and go, this is brilliant and I'm getting more from screen, but I wanted more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't watch Sopranos. I was up for three roles on Sopranos. Oh, uh, oh. And uh, I, I couldn't watch it because, and you know what? I had a lot of Italian relatives from New Jersey who said, hey, I'm glad you didn't get on that show Sopranos. I don't like the way they portray the guineas. You know, I said, okay, <laughs> okay. But if I got it, I would have done it. <laughs> oh, you would have. Come on now. Yeah, I know. I was uh, I was up for, for, for two really good roles. I went in to read for the lead. but uh, And David Chase grew up in Mount Lakes, supposedly, which is right next to Boonton, where I grew up, you know? Right. Okay, yeah. But uh, that, just, that just never worked out. And the very last one. Mm-hmm. Uh, they didn't even put a breakdown out for the character. It was between me and Steve Buscemi to play Stevie B. And Buscemi had a really good relationship with HBO and, and Empire came out after that. and stuff. So he got the role. But the funny thing was that the scenes that they showed me, Tony Soprano says to, 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 to Tony B, I think Tony B was the character's name, right? Right. Buscemi played. He says, uh, Oh, you look in shape. Oh, look at you. You look in shape, right? And uh, so Tony B goes, well, what else you got to do in prison but work out? Well, you know they took all that stuff out when Buscemi got the role. <laughs> you, know. you can't do that with Steve. No, no. You definitely. I mean, um, not that I want to embarrass you, but Ming, uh, give me give me photo 13 because this, uh -oh. this really shows you that this man in his prime, I mean, buff to say the least. I mean, do I mean I gotta ask Pete? I mean, how many days a week do you work out, and just to stay in the shape that you're staying in? I get five days a week in, um, and uh, one day is actually now it's because uh, of uh, COVID. It's uh, straight yoga. One day is straight yoga, and the other four days are uh, in my cellar. I have a Bowflex machine, thank God, because I can't get to the gym, you know. So. Uh, you know, I uh, and now I'm I'm going back to do an episode of SWAT. So you know, I got to stay in shape. Those guys are all you know, about twenty years younger and in shape. You know, 
No question about it. Uh, uh, since you bring up SWAT, that means Mumford is definitely going to be at least making uh, one episode or hopefully more appearances down uh, there. I'd love to see him come back for more. But, yeah, there's. Th- we're, I'm going to go to work after the first on one episode. It's going to be really fun. Mm-hmm. Really fun. That'd be really cool. That definitely be gonna be great to see you back. And of course, SWAT is on uh, the CBS lineup. I believe it's actually Wednesday nights at ten o'clock, if I remember correctly. That sounds right to me. That sounds good. Um, we got Peter Onorati here on the A game, and you actually have appeared on what three of the major networks over the last year. I mean, you're still doing um, the flashback segments. Uh, Ming Photo Four uh, to remind everybody that. Um, uh, the man is still a part of This Is Us in those flashback segments. It's Jack's father, and that's on uh, NBC right. on Tuesday nights. Then you've got a recent arc you did on Station 19 on ABC. That's right. And then with uh, we, um, CBS, um, if I can get that photo up here, it's number 19. And you recently appeared on uh, Mom, and there's you and Mimi Kennedy. That's a great photo. Yeah. By the way. And, you know, Mimi Kennedy played my sister-in-law in my short-lived sitcom, Joe's Life. Life, yeah. Uh, was that the first time you guys had worked together since then? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that had a feel kind of fun to kind of see, like, oh, my God, it's been oh, It what? was great. It was great. When I walked on that set, there was Mimi that I, I was going to play her love interest. Right. And one of the consulting exec producers is a woman named Ann Flett. And one of the executive producers is a guy named Marco Panette, who just produced a, a B Positive. And they were on my first job on Kate and Alley. Oh, it's amazing how this just kind of just goes round and round and round. Oh, it was wonderful to be with them again. Yeah. I mean, I got, and the dynamic of the show I know is a little different now, but it also helps. I think Mimi's character is going to develop a little bit more now in the show, I think. I think so, too. I think, you know, uh, uh, Allison probably wants a little uh, break. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, yeah, I hope so. But I, I, you know, I hope they bring Wayne back. Uh, they just substituted another boyfriend for her. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see. You know? Definitely. You got a movie out right now, which is getting some good reviews. It's called The Last Champion, and that is starring Cole Hauser, and it's also featuring Hallie Todd. Now, Cole, we know from Yellowstone and a lot of other great projects. Hallie Todd played uh, Lizzie McGuire's mom. She's also the co-writer of this film, and it's got this kind of, as I'll say, it feels like a biopic in a sense that it's based on a true story, but it actually isn't, and you guys went to some, I would say, small town Washington to kind of really get the feel for the movie. Well, we stayed in Pullman, Washington, which is where Washington State University is. Okay. Uh, but we filmed in the outer, smaller towns out, out and around there. Mm-hmm. And this was an, an incredible experience for me because I played a wrestling coach and I wrestled in high school and was supposed to wrestle in college. But be, be, since I started in football, I didn't want to lose weight anymore. Right. And uh, when I when I stepped on those mats, I called the director over who was Hallie. Todd's uh, husband, Glenn. Glenn with uh, her. And uh, he said, what's the matter? And I said, uh, you, you got to give me a minute, man. I uh, the, Just the mats and, and, and the wrestling and it was just, it really took me back. And, and I had a hard time just, you know, getting started. It was, it was visceral. It was so amazing to me, you know? Yeah. And, and, uh, and of course, my death, ooh, my my scene, your scene, <laughs> happened at one in the morning and zero degrees, and oh, I, no. you know, so let everybody. But you know, it's number one on iPhones now. Yeah, photo twenty one. So we can emphasize that, by the way, the number one drama on Apple TV as we speak. So yeah. I mean, that's great news for the movie. I mean, and especially in this time that we're living in in COVID, it is about. If you want to see a good movie, you got to go through Apple TV. You got to go through Netflix. And this is on all the streaming platforms as we speak. Yeah. And there's a lot of incredible talent. Uh, Annika Marks is beautiful. She's in it. Um, you know, there's a, 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 um, you know, a lot of people that, you know, I should probably have it written down. But, you know, it's just uh, it was just a great project to do. And. I really loved that part of, of the country, even though it was all snow, it was completely covered, man. It was just wow. amazing. And and here's the thing. Mm-hmm. Glenn, I, I, I was told that Glenn Withrow started out as a, a photographer. When you see this movie, mm-hmm. I mean, even beyond the writing and the acting, 
this movie is beautiful. They got these guys running through the snow and training for wrestling, you know, in, 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 in Washington through these groves of, of, of birch trees or something. Just it's so beautiful to look at, man. That's interesting. Yeah. Obviously, his background really gave him a good eye to get the to really capture the scenery in a, in a way that you, you just didn't expect. Yeah, really, really something. Definitely check it out. The Last Champion, again, it's available on all platforms for streaming. If you're looking for a really good movie, this is a really good feel-good movie, a shot of redemption kind of movie. Definitely check it out. Peter Honorati is here on the A-game with me. All right, this is where I go to the part of the random shots. I, I'm, I'm behind you. I, you've already taken a couple. Right. So as I get ready for the random shots segment, I will say salute to you. Be a little sloppy here, but I'll get my shot in. This is a, what have we got here? Oh, Coffee Vodka from Death Wish. God bless me. Salute. Salute. From one fellow Italian to another. That's what I like. That's right. Chindani. Chindan. Exactly. Now, see, now I feel like I'm at home. And <laughs> you know, before we even get to the random shots, since you are Italian like me with the holidays coming up, was the Seven Fishes a party or a tradition growing up? Um, you know, I never knew that it was, but my grand my father's mother made Christmas Eve, so I'm sure it was all there. But you know, I didn't. I never ate any of that stuff. I my grandmother used to make this incredible fried pizza dough on uh, on Christmas Eve. You know, with the marinara sauce, and yeah. that's what I just stuck my face in the whole night. And the antipasto, you know, with no meat and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, but yeah, we. I'm sure we had it. And then uh, Christmas Day was at my mother's parents' house. Uh, my grandfather was. Uh, Shoemaker uh, uh, in Denville, New Jersey. Uh, my mother's father. My father's father died in 1961, and he started Honorati and Sons Construction. And then my uncle and my uncle Paul and my father took over, and uh, and that's where I spent my summers working. <laughs> nice. Now I got a, I got a question about the summers coming up in uh, random shots. But the first one, since you mentioned earlier, swatting all these guys like Shamar Moore. Lou Ferrigno Jr., who are all very well-built gentlemen. So I was thinking about this. If the 36-year-old version of you could arm wrestle the 36-year-old now, Lou Ferrigno Jr., who wins? Wow. I think Louie wins. He's a bigger guy. He's got leverage. He's got long, you mm -hmm. know, long arms and stuff. I don't know. I, I, I would say I'm, I'm a terrible arm wrestler. I don't know what it is about, you know. But uh, I would say Louie. I, I would say, yeah. Really? Yeah, because I mean, we showed the photo earlier because I think you were probably right around that age. And I'm sitting there going, oh, he could hold his own against Lou Ferrigno Jr. Come on. In that photo that you showed, I was 41. Okay. You know what? Give me the full shot, Ming, on number 18 so we can remind everybody. So you're 41 in this photo. I mean, dude, you're in incredible shape, obviously. You yeah, know? well, you know, and I trained for it too, you know. But, I, you know, I listen, I've been training since I got – you know, cut from pro football I, I, after college, you know right. what I mean? So, you know, it was, uh, uh, I, I, I just never stopped. I just kicked it up a little bit and did a few other things like, uh, cut, cut dairy out or whatever, you know? And, uh, you know, so, I mean, uh, I'm still, Hey, for my age, I'm all right. Uh, no, you're, you're good at my age for God's sake, please. <laughs> <laughs> Random shots with Peter Honorati. Okay. I, I do realize you've done some voiceovers in cartoons, uh, some of them with the Batman series, some of them with the uh, Justice League. So when you were growing up, what was one of your favorite cartoons growing up? You know, I it's, it's, it's going to really date me, but the cartoons that I watched were, were like Flintstones and stuff like that. There wasn't really – there was – Astro Boy was like – which is the first like anime, I guess. And, yeah. and, uh, and, and I used to – we used to have this routine – in high school, uh, before a game, the games were usually at uh, 11 on, mm -hmm. on Saturday uh, in Boonton. And so we would all go out and have breakfast early, and then we'd come to my house and watch the Pink Panther cartoons. Oh, they were great. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and then we go, you know, so I don't remember, you know, I, I remember Johnny Quest. I remember uh, – uh, let's see. I said the Flintstones and the Jetsons, you know, those Hanna-Barbera uh, classics. They're still uh, today, man. They're still running somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 But not, you know, like nothing like my kids grew up with or that that, that I've worked in, you know, here, you know, not, none of these. Uh, I, I don't remember anything because, you know what? Sometimes cartoons were live action like Batman with uh, Adam West, you know, right. <laughs> and horrible cowl that looked like a, you know, a bad hair piece, you know. 
<laughs> as you're taking a sip on that drink, I mean, when it comes to that, uh, do you have a, a favorite adult beverage in general? I do now. Um, well, I have a wine cellar, and I like Ooh, nice. I, I, I have a little wine cellar, and uh, I like collecting wine. So I would say that 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 I would say that you know red wines are my favorite, but I drink martinis. I drink vodka, potato vodka martinis. And one of the reasons is because when my father, um, when my father retired, you know, he never drank. You know, he had a beer once in a while or something. But when he retired, he started this thing with martinis, you know. Hmm. And he was out here with me one time, and uh, I came in from work, and he's sitting on my patio, and he goes, you want a martini? I go, no, I don't drink that shit. He goes, I made you one. I went, okay, Pop, right? Sure. So I had a martini with my father. So uh, that's what started me. Every time I lifted one, you know, I would think of my pops, you know. Oh, that's nice. And, and then here's here's an even better one. Never <laughs> smoked a thing in my life. I can't smoke cigarettes. Can't be around them because I'm allergic to them. Okay. But I was doing a movie in Canada one time, and I had to buy a gift for somebody. And Joe Montaigne was up there doing a movie as well. And I know Joe because his daughter went to the same uh, uh, elementary school as my kids, and we would do you know benefits and stuff together. So we kind of knew each other. Right. Right. So. He calls me up in my room. He goes, what are you doing? I said, well, I don't know, nothing. He says, let's go down to Gaslight in Vancouver. And I said, well, what, what's a Gaslight? He goes, oh, it's this section. It's really old. You get, you can buy Cuban cigars and stuff. And I said, well, I don't smoke cigars. He goes, just come on, let's go. Sure. So I had to buy a gift for somebody who I knew liked Cuban cigars. Mm-hmm. So um, I went in, I bought five cigars, and I came home. And I kept one of those cigars. I gave the four to the guy. And then my godson comes down. He was a chef at the time. He lives here now in L.A., but he was a chef in Seattle. And uh, I'm sitting on a patio, uh, and I said to my godson, I said, you don't smoke cigars, do you? He goes, yeah. <laughs> I said, uh, well, I got this Cuban cigar, you know, Monte Cristo number two, like the premier, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, said, I said, is it too skeevy to, like, share it? He goes, Oh, I said, okay. So I poured us each some cognac and I shared a cigar with my godson. And it was the first time in my life that I stopped doing everything else. It was almost meditative in a way, right? Right. So that next summer, I'm I'm taking my kids back to the Jersey Shore. We're down in Avalon. And uh, my father comes out on the veranda and he goes, what a gin and tonic? I go, I don't drink those. He goes, come on, I made you one. I said, okay. Okay. We're sitting there having a gin and tonic. And, uh, you know, my father, you know, grew up in the 40s and 30s in, in, in New Jersey. You know, he smoked. He smoked cools when I was a kid, you know. Oh, yeah. uh, Things were vicious. My dad smoked them. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> so, but he, he quit, right? Um, and I'll tell you why. So, I said, Pop, I said, uh, you want a cigar? He goes, Oh, Mr. Get Me to Quit Fucking Smoking 1968, you got cigars? And I said, yeah, I, I got these Cuban cigars. He goes, get them out, right? So I'm out there having a gin and tonic a cigar. And my father leans in. He says to my mother, and my kids are in there. And he goes, hey, hon, I'm having a cigar with my son, you know? And so Martini Cigar is my pops, you know? <laughs> So that's 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 what I, I mean. I mean, I have one cigar a month or two, maybe. No, but it's interesting because I'm watching you. You're lighting up. As you're talking about this, Peter. I think that's amazing. You just you just like you can feel your father right now just by talking about it. I think it's great. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned yeah. Apple. obviously that's your spot when you're visiting with the family to come down to the beach. But when you were a kid, what was the beach that you went to? Wildwood. 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 Eh? Good choice. You know, and I and actually the kids and I went to Wildwood originally, and then we just it just got a little crazy, so we, we shifted up to Avalon. But no, we always went down to Wildwood. Mm-hmm. We stayed at the All Star Motel every year. We nice, met my nice. my friends from Philly that we met, you know, years ago would come down and be there the same weekend. In fact, I did a a couple Philadelphia accents uh, on a couple different TV shows, and the producer said, "You where where'd you grow up in Philly?" I go, "I didn't. I grew up in North Jersey." Wow. You know, and, and I said. I spent my summers with him. And then when I went to Lycoming College up in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, my mm-hmm. roommate was from the northeast of Philly. He was from, you know, the Cotman area, uh, Cotman Avenue area. 
right? You know, right. he's like, like, where are you going? Where are you? Where are you going? You going there? Okay, you know. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I, I love doing this. And, and then this is us. If you listen really close, you'll hear a little Pittsburgh accent because yeah, uh, yeah. there was a lot of guys from Pittsburgh out there, you know, at, at Lycoming as well. You know? It's funny you mentioned Wildwood, but I got this great photo. We can pull up number eight, Ming, and I think you were at Seaside Heights at this point. And it, yes, this was 15 days before Sandy hit. Yeah, we got the last footage. That was the movie West End, which is a great movie with yeah. Eric yeah. Roberts and and me and and uh, my friend Isabella Hoffman. And uh, uh, he's, he's yeah. adorable. Oh, by uh, by the way, you know, no question. Yeah. I, this is the one of the other connections with us. Um, you came on my radio show when I was working on 1071 The Boss, doing the morning show, to promote the movie. Um, oh, yeah. you just with your time, it was uh, just fun to talk about that. And thinking about it, the connection goes a little further because the reason we got the interview because the executive, one of the executive producers of the film, is a woman named Michelle Hurley, who yeah. happened to be one of our salespeople at the. Yeah. And Michelle was like going, hey, listen, we want to promote this movie. It's like uh, I said, um, listen, it's going to sound crazy, but I know Peter Honorati right now is kind of on a roll with a lot of things. Because at that point, you came on when This Is Us was hitting. You're on yeah. SWAT. You got the movie. It was like, and you were like, yeah, I'll do it. I was like, really? Yeah. 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 It worked That's out. Movie. Yeah. West End is a great movie. I, you know, it was it, it got kind of shuffled around and, and, and through some bad deals. but. Uh, it's still out there on Amazon and stuff. Yeah. It's a great piece. That, that's got to be frustrating sometimes when you know you've got something really good and it gets lost in the cracks. But that happens a lot more than people realize, doesn't it? Well, this is more frustrating for my my best friend, Joe Basile, who was Jersey Shore guy, you know, uh, grew up down there and wrote the whole movie mm -hmm. of, you know, about the shore for, for that reason. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, it's always, you know, listen, uh, for me, I wasn't a producer. I was a producer because I helped to, to cast and do a few things. Right. But this was Joe's baby, and it should have had a, a, a bigger life. Uh, but like I said, you know, sometimes you get these people who try to do a deal for you, and they end up screwing the deal up, uh -huh. which then disallows you from going on to somebody else in, in due time right. to get a different deal. And that's what happened with West End. And you know, it, it, I mean, West End could have been what the last champion is easily right. you know uh different movie of course but uh yeah, but have, so, the, have the same level of success let's put it that way sure yeah sure, absolutely yeah. it's that good you know yeah and yeah. uh but but you know but in, in terms of you know disappointments hell you can't be in this business if, if, if you can't handle disappointment yeah yeah you definitely have to have that thick skin no question that's about one it. of the greatest gifts for me of, of having become an actor is that you know, when I was younger, I took myself really seriously, even through my business career, you know, my MBA, I thought there were things expected of me and I, you know, right. but in, that, in acting in this business, in this town, if you take yourself too seriously, you die, you right. die right, right. there. Uh, speaking of not taking yourself too seriously, um, what does Uncle Floyd mean to you? Give me photo number 10, Ming. <laughs> That is Saul and Herschel Kipperman, the only Hasidic Siamese twin comedy team on the planet. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's my friend Gary Richmond. He, he and I, when I was still in the business world, I joined this improvisational comedy group. Mm -hmm. And so I would work out with them, and we'd do all the crappy little hole-in-the-wall places in New York City. Mm -hmm. And then we had this uh, Improv Olympics uh, and we won our, our particular group of Port Authority Theater Ensemble, we were called. <laughs> uh, we won. So we went to Chicago to Second City. Right. And, and Gary, who you know was Jewish, was raised in the Jewish community, always did this great old Jewish guy, you know. And so we were off stage at Second City, and I said, Hey, uh, lock up arms with me. Let's go in as Siamese twin. As the old Jewish guy. And so that's where the Kippermans were created. And right, now right, right. my two, two of my best friends from, from uh, uh, elementary school through high school were Robert and Alice Kipperman twins. And Robert Kipperman is a nationally, if not worldly, worldly renowned cardiologist now and works out of Morristown, New Jersey. How about that? And sister Alice was a, uh, was a photojournalist for a while. Now she's in real estate in New York, but 
I used their last name because they were twins and, and uh, uh, you know, they haven't, uh, you know, disconnected from me yet. <laughs> but, but we used to do a ton of great, you know, uh, parodies. Uh, this was before Weird Al and all that stuff. And uh, in fact, we had a, we had a Christmas song that started out with uh, bag men warming on the garbage fire. <laughs> Snot is dripping from your nose. It, it, it goes on, you know. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and, and I should emphasize that only people from the tri-state area, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, really knew the Uncle Floyd show, like you and yeah. I here, obviously. And that was like, I would say, like, early 70s to, like, the late 80s where Uncle Floyd was doing his thing. Yes, yeah, I think it might have even gone into the early, late sixties because wow. he, had, he had big acts on that show. I heard he had Simon and Garfunkel on that show at one time. He had a lot of big acts that had come to New York City, and right. they would just do his show, man. And he was—I'm still in touch with some of those guys. I haven't had close touch with Floyd, but uh, um, there's a, a couple guys that I'm, I'm still in touch with, you know, on Facebook and stuff. Yeah, and, sure. uh, but but Floyd still does his show. Actually comes to uh, to he, he comes to, to do a nice Knights of Columbus steak dinner in Boonton, and all my <laughs> friends call me and said, "Hey, Floyd's here, you know, and say hello, and you know." But you know that Floyd's uh, he's that's a very musical family. His brother, I think his name is Jimmy Vivino, uh, was one of the writers or composers on Greece. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I, I, I'm not absolutely positive, but pretty sure. But just one of Floyd's a really great musical talent, man. When he plays that honky tonk piano, he's amazing, you know? It leads me to ask because I can see that there is a comic in you when I look at back on Uncle Floyd and some of the things. Just you're cracking me up here. But is there a preference in you? Because you do a lot of drama. So is there a preference between comedy or drama? Or is it just like, you know what? I'm a working actor. You give me a good script, I'm going to nail it. No, I have no preference whatsoever. I mean, I love to make people laugh, and and, and uh, but I have had some people come to me over the years about certain dramatic things that I've done. People 10, 12 years after Civil Wars was over who had been going through a divorce and watched the show, and they're like, oh, my God, you helped me. But, the, you know, so, I mean, I've had as much I, – I, I don't want to – this is sound egotistical, but it's not. It, it, what, I'm, what I mean to say is – I noticed as much impact from my dramatic stuff as I have from my comic stuff. You know, mm -hmm. the impact of the comic is, is the reward for me really when I hear people laughing, you know, that's like instant um, gratification for you. Is that a good way of putting it? It's what? Like almost instant gratification because you're getting that laugh right away. It's just kind of like, boom. Yeah. That's why we did the Kippermans in, in, in some of the comedy clubs in New York, you know, right, uh, right. in fact, we did the Kippermans in a place called Comedy U, which was on University, uh, in, in in you know uh, in the east, almost the East Village there, and and then it moved down to Soho. Um, we did uh, we did the Improv once or twice, right. Uh, right? But when we were at Comedy U, the headliners were Joy Behar, Ellen De <sighs> Ellen DeGeneres, right. And a good friend of mine who's still she's she's in France right now, but Susie Sorrow, who became a writer mostly. Um, and then my wife, my wife was doing comedy at the time as well with her partner. Uh, and she actually did a, a lot more than we did. She did Catch a Rising Star. She did, uh, you know, a, a, a bunch of other cabarets. And uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, Joy Behar introduced yeah. us or Ellen DeGeneres introduced us at one point. That's crazy. <laughs> That's something. And, and it's during that time. That's like you said, you, you're kind of meeting your wife during that time. I mean, yeah. I mean, did you know right away? Because I'm going to put up, uh, was it photo 17? Because I think it's an adorable photo. There's the two of you. <laughs> and yeah. I was, it's funny, the sense of humor. You talk about comedy. I'm like going, there's the sense of humor coming out of her on that photo, too. Yeah. And well, she, when I met when I met Jeanette, I was still at McCall's magazines. She was. I was doing improv uh, uh, with with the group, and then she entered the group. She had come from another group, right. and she was a starving actress. She had four jobs. She'd get up four o'clock in the morning and go to a great place called Patisserie Lanciani, and 
and then she'd go work uh, doing key punch in the garment district. Then she'd do key punch for Citibank, and then she would go work at this great bar where, uh, which actually the guy that was a bartender there was the reason we're all together. His name was Hal Peller. Uh, it was called Cody's. It was the only uh, automatic bull. Uh, uh, it was a country western bar, but he had an automatic bull there. You know, oh, wow. yeah. yeah, like uh, Irving Cowboy, and uh, so we started uh, dating uh, briefly, and uh, so then I, I had um, I had some of my research published, and uh, mm-hmm. I started getting calls from all the big package goods firms, P and G and Bronfman, and all these places, you know, about my research. And I said to them, "Listen, you subscribe to the same research as I do. You paid for." It's just the way I looked at it. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you all my raw research so your people don't have to do the work. If you take out a package of ads in my magazines, which was McCall's, McCall's Working Mother, and a couple of others, right? They said deal. So now they start calling me back and wanting to steal me away. Mm-hmm. So I walked into my boss's office. Now, I worked with 15 women. Two were my superiors, and 15 were at my level or subordinate. I got more penis birthday cakes than you could imagine. Okay. And my <laughs> boss and I, she and I were buddies. We had a share in a house in the Hamptons, all that yuppie shit that everybody did. Right. So I walked into her and I said, listen, these guys are trying to steal me away. I really don't want to leave. Um, but you know, they're offering me some pretty good money. We have a bonus system. Last year the bonus was a little anemic. Can you help me out this year? You know? And she said, Oh, wait, well. She goes, the publisher doesn't know what you're doing. I said, wait right there. I went in my office and I got a loose leaf notebook that I had kept for the four years that I was there. Mm-hmm. And I put it on her desk and I said, now, before I open this book, I want you to remember that I came to you from Ford Motor Company, where my territory was $30 million a year. Oh. And if you learn anything at Ford, you learn how to cover your ass. Okay. <laughs> so I opened the book up and I had tear sheets and I had dates that I had pitched her ideas and tear sheets from the magazine when it affected a change in editorial or whatever. Right. I said, right. well, who does the publisher think did this? She goes, and then she really got pissed. <laughs> so she started to make my life miserable. So Jeanette said to me, I really think you could be an actor. And I said, Oh, so I can starve and have four jobs like you. <laughs> so once I took the ice pack off my eye, I decided to try it. <laughs> and that's when I enrolled. I quit. I walked in. I said, you can't fire me. Mm-hmm. Uh, because my work is too good. So I'll leave. And, uh, you know, uh, you make it so I can collect unemployment if I need to. And I went and uh, I, I never turned back, you know. But I, I was insulated more than almost any other actor ever. I had an MBA. I had 12 years in the business world and I liked what I was doing. I could have gone back to it in a heartbeat. I would go to an audition and I would want the job as bad as anybody else, but I didn't need it. Right. Uh, I had advantage. Huge. Yeah. Huge. You know? And, and then, and, you know, and I started doing commercials and, and I made more of my first year as an actor doing commercials than I ever made as a marketing and advertising executive on Park Avenue. So I go, well, you know, I'm going to try this for a couple of years. And gl- hey, look, it's worked out. I'm glad you're here and glad you're doing what you're doing, my friend. It's a wonderful thing. So am I and so my kids' uh, colleges that I paid their tuitions for. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> One more random shot to wrap up here, and I want to tap into the fact that, like you said, you played college football. You even tried out for the World Football League, so fo- there's a passion for football. And I also know uh, Photo 14 here, Ming, and you're a big fan of Jim Kick and the Miami Dolphins. And that team in 73 who ran the table, the only team to ever do it, there's always yep. comparisons from the 73 Dolphins to other teams later on the same. Oh, well, yeah. that Patriots team could have beaten that Dolphins team. You watched that Dolphins team. Has any team ever come close to that Dolphins team that you pulled for? Well, first of all, it's hard for me to to, to give a, an objective opinion because Jimmy Kick was my hero. He went to Booton High School. He went to my high school. Mm-hmm. He graduated at the same way that I graduated, and I wanted my career to be like his career. The only problem was he went to Wyoming, I went to Lycoming, and after one year, he was up to 210. We're not sure how he did that, but <laughs> Lycoming didn't do that, you know. Um, so I always loved it. But no, you, I, I, there, 
there was this synergy around that that Miami team. You know, he had Bonaconti. Bonaconti was like my size, yes. who was probably one of the best linebackers in you know in the NFL. You know, um, and you can't you can't compare because the game has changed so much and the way people train for it, the way people build themselves for the game. I look at I look at a wide receiver going out, which is what I played now. And I look at the hand play and I look at the pulling and all that shit. And I go, how can you not call pass interference on either guy every play? So why would anybody bitch about a pass interference call if you're letting them do that? You know, Great the game point. Changed so much, you know, it's so hard, not just because the personnel have changed and people are bigger and faster. You got linemen running five flat forties, 300 pounds, you know, um, you know, some backs didn't do that when I was in college or when, you know, when, when the pros were around at that time. So, so it's, it's so hard to compare, but it's even harder to compare because of what they've done with the rules. And, and, and it, you know, and it, so it bugs me. So, you know, but I, you know, and poor Jimmy, you know, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy's gone and passed away last year. Oh. And he, Jimmy Kick was a 210-pound halfback. Mm -hmm. And he opened the holes up for Zonka, who was a 250-pound fullback. So Jimmy's head, I mean, he died of, of, you know, with dementia and everything else. Was I'm sure there was a ton of CTE there, you know. Uh, um, but that was the game then. You can't even hit somebody with your head now. No, you can't. No, the game's definitely different. That's and if, and if you're going low on somebody and they happen to slip and are lower and you hit them head to head, it's your fault. Yeah. You know, it's crazy, you know? And to take it one step further, looking back on that team with Zonka, the type of back that he was, there's only maybe one back in the NFL that's even remotely like him. That's Derrick Henry of the Tennessee Titans, who is that 250, 260-pound guy who runs north to south and he doesn't yeah. run back to you. He runs over you. That's what Zonka did. You want if you ever look at Zonka, Zonka was not, you know, th today these guys are built with this huge V and they're like, you know, like bodybuilders. Look at Zonka, he's built like a bullet. Everything is in his core, right? And if you watch the old um uh, the old films of Zonka, I can't show I don't know if I can show you here, but somebody came to tackle Zonka, he right. would put his arm on top of his thigh like this, okay? okay. The guy would come in here to tackle him he would just lift them right off from the tackle and keep going. And that's what he did. He just like kind of moved them right off with his, with his forearm, you know, it was, it was this different game. It was a different game, you know? And, and, and I mean, I still love watching the game, but I get, I get frustrated, you know, a, a, a lot. And, uh, you know, uh, but you know, at least something I can, you know, I can be like a real old man and say, "Ah, oh, when I played, you couldn't show that shit." <laughs> you know, when I was your age. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Honorati, I got to thank you for this. This has been an absolute blast. And another thing I got to thank you for, because you provided me with one of my guests a few weeks ago, the very talented singer Henry Hall. Um, that was a great podcast. So thank you for that, by the way. Well, he's a great kid. He's really talented. You know, and I only, I only. I don't know Henry as well as I know his parents, but uh, but he's really I, I I just love his 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 approach to his music. I, I I like I said I have said before that I hear you know I hear Brian Wilson, I hear Christopher Cross, I hear all this stuff in, in there. You know that that's just it's kind of new. It's a new old, you know. Yeah, and that's the comparison I was making because you go with the older artists, and I can go with a lot of the 90s artists like Jeff Buckley that he's obviously been influenced by. And it's a perfect meld of what he's doing. And I hope he gets more of a chance because I think he's perfect for alternative radio right now in 2020. Absolutely. And he has his mother's sense of humor. Yes. Oh, well, that, that one song. And by the way, yeah, if you get – go to Henry Hall's website. Check out the music. I think it's a great plug for him. He's got a song yeah. called I that is just hilarious. It's very tongue-in-cheek and it's very dry wit, but it's phenomenal. It's good stuff. By the way, his father has a great sense of humor, too. But I just – but his mother is, is, you know, is more prominent. You can see it. Brad is a fantastic writer, you know. Yeah, and the Brad, way I know them is that Brad and my wife, Jeanette, grew up in Santa Barbara. They did you feel there together. That's how I met Brad. In fact, when I met Brad and Julia, 
I'll, if, if you got a time problem, I see a quick story. Um, so I, when I was still, when I was dating Jeanette, and I was still in the business world. Brad and Julia were on um, SNL. They were okay. on the incarnation of when they were on SNL. So we all met for dinner and blah, blah, blah. Two years later, I'm ingrained in the business. We're out here. Jeanette and I bought a house. We're having our son's first birthday. Maybe it was three or three years later. Mm -hmm. And Julia and Brad show up to my son's first birthday party, right? And Julia walks in and, and I said, what are you doing now? She goes, oh, you know, she goes, I heard you're doing this thing called cop rock, you know. And I said, yeah, I said, I don't know. I just, I just botch go. So, I, you know, I said, well, what are you doing? She said, well, they want me to do this thing called the Seinfeld Chronicles. I don't know if I want to do it. You know, I'll be the only girl. Because if you remember, Seinfeld came out with like four episodes or something in the summer before they ever aired called the Seinfeld Chronicles. That's right. That's true. Man. And Julia wasn't on that iteration. So. So she says, well, I don't know if I want to do it. And I said, well, you know what? I remember Jerry Seinfeld from the stand-up clubs in New York. He was really funny. And, you know, and <laughs> it's iconic. You know? It is definitely a part of our culture that will never die. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt yeah. about that. Um, let me wrap up by saying The Last Champion, the movie is out on all streaming services, go out, enjoy the movie, look for Peter very soon in a return as Mumford in SWAT and SWAT's on Wednesday nights at 10 o'clock on CBS, and of course his flashback segments will pop up periodically on This Is Us, Tuesday nights, 9 o'clock on NBC, I think I got all the plugs in and Peter, thank you so much for doing this, my friend. Oh, that's cool, Rob, thanks. Thank you. We'll do another version of the A-game real soon. Until then, have a great week ahead and stay safe.